Welcome to Modern Medicine. I'm Dr. Dave Moylan, Medical Director of the Simon Kramer Cancer Institute. And I once more have two fascinating uh, guests in the fields of macrobiotic lifestyle and macrobiotic uh, diet, Mr. Ed Esco and his fiance, Naomi Ishikawa. And uh, we were talking last session about uh, phytoestrogens, plant-based uh, estrogen compounds. And one thing that I continue to get many questions on are, is it safe to use soy if you have a diagnosis, a personal diagnosis of breast cancer? I'd like you to share uh, your thoughts. And again, now the watchword in medicine, internal medicine, uh, cancer medicine, oncology is what is the evidence? or the recommendation evidence-based. Uh, and I'm also going to ask you, Ed, to talk about your affiliation with the Harvard uh, and uh, Tufts medical community in uh, Boston. And Boston, I have a lot of affection for. That was where I went to undergraduate school at a little technical institute down on the Charles River, MIT. Yeah. But, uh, and uh, also I want our viewers to know that uh, Mr. Esco has published many times in the field of macrobiotics, and uh, this is just one of the recent uh, revisions of his work. And here is another one, uh, Crohn's and colitis, Crohn's colitis and uh, ulcerative colitis, the macrobiotic approach. Ed? Uh, thank you, doctor. Um, there's a lot of controversy regarding this whole soy and breast cancer issue. So we'd like to clear that up if we could. First of all, let's see what is considered to be so-called good soy and not so good soy. Good soy are traditional soy foods like tofu, soybean curd, miso, fermented soybean paste, tempeh, traditionally fermented soybean cake, and soy sauce. We all know soy sauce, but there are good soy sauces and bad ones. Ed, can I just uh, ask a question here? Yes, please. Where would these uh, foods be typically available? Well, the Whole Foods markets around the country are selling, as are many natural food stores, as well as online. You can order these foods. Um, and they're the good soy. Yeah. Look for the, the, the labeling organic. So that rules out GMO, genetically modified soy. Okay. Anyway, these products have been in the human diet, especially in Japan and China and Asia, for over a thousand years or more. And they apparently were part of the reason why Japanese women had practically no breast cancer until recent times. So the evidence, and this is coming from Susan Komen, uh, who is one of the leading authorities, that website on breast cancer issues, um, and these are all science-based studies. So here's what they said. Uh, if there's one solid, can quote, if there's one solid conclusion from all the data on soy and breast cancer, it's that eating moderate amounts of soy foods very likely does not increase the risk of breast cancer. The majority of high quality studies and analyses have found that soy foods do not increase risk, even when eaten at levels higher than those typically seen in the US. As a survivor, is soy safe, the question is. Though the estrogen-like properties of soy seem like they could increase the risk of breast cancer recurrence or mortality, current studies suggest that eating moderate amounts of soy foods is safe for breast cancer survivors. And some studies have actually shown the Women who are eating soy, traditional soy products uh, after a breast cancer diagnosis had a 25% lower risk of recurrence compared to those eating practically no soy food. So maybe even beneficial for recovery or the survival from breast cancer. Now the issue of good and bad. Good and bad. Good is these traditional tofu, miso, tempeh, soy sauce, and a product called natto, which I hope we can introduce natto. in the area. Bad are modern-day processed soy products, tofu, 
plus sugar ice cream. Okay, so, soy protein isolate, in which the protein is isolated out from all of the other nutrient factors and producing things like, you may have seen, soy hot dogs, soy cheese, all of these so-called soy bologna, kind of fake, the soy products, which were never used before maybe the 1970s, actually. Yeah. These we don't recommend. Also like soy milk flavored with sugar and chocolate. Yes compared to traditional soy milk. These are we call the not so good soy products compared to these authentic thousand year old time tested soy foods. The other issue too is soy, these soy products are most effective in preventing breast cancer when incorporated as part of a plant based diet on the whole similar to the Asian diet. Did you know Japanese women have the best longevity in the world today? No, I the did not. The best longevity. I sent you some studies on that, yeah. The highest longevity. Because their background is eating these foods and eating less of the harm, potentially harmful foods like dairy and meat. So these come with the highest recommendation and also because phytoestrogens, it's some studies are showing, cancel the effect of too much testosterone. So isn't it common sense to use that tofu and other soy foods for men to lower the risk or reduce the recurrence of prostate cancer rather than more radical approaches like orchiectomy or the uh, well, powerful hormones. I'm going to say hormones. that most of the uh, focuses of um, traditional approaches to uh, prostate cancer are focused on somehow lowering uh, testosterone, circulating testosterone. Well, this is a very safe way to do yeah. that with no side effects. Yeah. Um, we had a very lovely dinner last night here at the Simon Kramer Institute, and one of our guests was a dear friend of mine that I've known for a decade and a half, and you also have seen him uh, professionally. And he came down with a very nasty lymphoma. Okay. And the lymphomas, they run the gamut of aggressiveness. Uh, some type uh, that you can live with them for 20 years with uh, no problems. Others will kill you within uh, a year, or two years, or three years. And uh, this gentleman had a, a moderately aggressive one and his life expectancy in the medical literature was about three and a half years. And again, one of the recommendations that I heard time and time again at the Cushy Institute was don't stop your uh, traditional uh, therapy, follow your doctor's advice but this is a, a, a supplement. And he again took the heavy duty chemotherapy. He stopped short of the recommendation for going for a bone marrow transplant. Right. And then he uh, again searched around and learned macrobiotics. And uh, he's doing, I'm gonna say quite well, now nine and a half years wow. after the diagnosis that you know, surely could have uh, taken him away at th three, three or four years. So that was one of the anecdotes and the little stories we hear in addition to uh, Dr. Uh, Satellaro's uh, case that convinced me that there was something to this. I don't try to oversell it when I talk to people sure. about it. It's certainly a sensible way of eating. But a third case was a patient uh, with advanced lung cancer, what we call non-small cell lung cancer. It was also stage four and we knew that from a biopsy not only of the lung tumor, but of also a, a spine metastasis. The patient took the standard chemo and radiation, but he went macrobiotic. And normally we'd expect a survival of 15 to 18 months tops. It's been seven years. Oh yeah, wow. yeah. seven wow. years, you know. So th these get your attention. Yeah. Sure. But um, also there's uh, some, uh, cases not only of uh, cancer but of inflammatory diseases and I know uh, KI used to have some uh, DVDs on these incurable sure. cases mm -hmm. sure. I know you're familiar with some of those sure. if you could expound on I think well, Judy. They, range, they range the gamut um, from things like Crohn's disease colitis arthritis diabetes of course is one of the one of the most uh, responsive type 2 diabetes conditions for macrobiotics we can actually use the word cure okay which is you know controversial but if someone is type 2 diabetes and within a month is completely 
medicine free, managing, free of diabetes. That's definition of cure, and that goes on for five years or more, right? Yeah, I remember in training, they would say, you did not need one of these randomized double blind studies for penicillin. That was a miracle drug, yeah. and uh, you, you knew the people were gonna get better. You didn't have to test Saving a thousand lives, people. Right? Yeah. Saving lives, So we hope that, you know, a whole, what should we say, revolution within modern medicine begins. And modern medicine will get back to its roots. For example, Hippocrates, let food be thy medicine. Let medicine be thy food. Modern medicine started from there and has gone pretty far <laughs> afield. Yeah. Let's get back to those roots and incorporate a solid, nutritionally sound, plant-based macrobiotic diet together with the modern therapy so that all the odds are stacked in the favor of the patient. It's very sad when a patient goes in, for example, coronary bypass operation, right, because of clogged arteries. After being in the hospital the next day, right, they recover for breakfast, what comes in? Yeah. Eggs and bacon, the very foods that put them in there in the first place. This, so the, there's a tremendous, uh, what, lack of uh, coordination going on. We have to get yeah. it together. Okay. Well, we're going to take a, another break now, but when we come back, I'd like to talk to you both about how the macrobiotic revolution can come to Northeast Pennsylvania. Great. Welcome back to Modern Medicine. We have two very special guests with us for this segment. Uh, Ed Esco and uh, Naomi, his fiance, and these are macrobiotic uh, practitioners with long experience and uh, personal satisfying results. And they're both uh, fortunate in that they knew one of the originators of this uh, technique in the United States, and that is Michio Kushi, who recently expired. Um, could you uh, tell our viewers yeah. a little bit, bit about Mi this man? Micho came from Japan after World War II as a young student dedicated to world peace after the devastation of World War II. So he, through his research, he was a graduate of Tokyo University, which is like the Harvard of Japan, and discovered the macrobiotics, which was the way of health, the way of longevity, the way of peace through the natural traditional diet. And he realized that diets, nutrition, played a critical role in behavior, including the behavior of nations, the behavior of governments, whether peaceful or non-peaceful. So he felt that the most fundamental way to achieve world peace, planetary peace, was through uh, nutritional dietary change toward a plant-based macrobiotic diet. In other words, the more peaceful behavior pattern is established, the more spiritual mind is established. And of course, that involves health, physical and mental health as well. So he devoted his whole life to promoting that concept around the world, initially in uh, New York and Boston and then around the entire planet. So we had the privilege of working with him. I worked with him from 1973. Uh, up until his passing at age 88 and 20 to 14. Even up to the very last, the months with him, we were planning curricula, planning courses, planning the developments of macrobiotics worldwide. So it was really quite a privilege and he was quite an inspiration. Well, he was an epitome of macrobiotics, long life. That's right. Making it to 88. And you know. clear up until the yeah. very last, the moments. Yeah. Right? And Naomi, you also met uh, Mr. Kushi. Yes, Pushy. yeah. Unfortunately, I couldn't get not so many uh, study with him. Like I just last minute, you know, I get a few lecture with him. But always he Im inspired me. Like uh, he always taught us, you are what you eat. Yes. You know, that's really, you know, I'm really, you know, oh yes, you know, I feel that really. Mm. Well, now, he was married to Avelino uh, Cushy. Aveline Cushy, Aveline Tomoko Cushy, who was the, a student of the macrobiotic school in Tokyo. 
and came over around 1950 or so, around that time, to assist him in his the ventures here in the, the New World. And they were married many, many years yeah. until her passing. And then after that, he married um, um, a young lady named Midori. So it was Mitro and Midori Kushi, and she cared for him in his the senior years. Yeah. She was a very, very valuable contribution also. Well, uh, Mr. Kushi was inspired by the devastation that he saw uh, in his own country. Yeah. You know, the United States uh, was blessed in that uh, there were no battles uh, on our, our mainland, but he would have seen the devastation yeah, of the including, fire bombings. including Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Nagasaki. Atom atomic bombings. Is there any evidence or at least experience in treating radiation sickness with macrobiotics. Well, there's the famous hospital story, the St. Francis Hospital in Nagasaki, which um, was spared the devastation, was close to ground zero, but spared the devastation of the initial blast. And because the head medical director was a macrobiotic practitioner, medical practitioner, he had his entire staff and all the patients on brown rice, miso soup, the pumpkin, local vegetables, and no sugar, no meat. Mm -hmm. And it, they call it the miracle of St. Francis, but uh, nobody in his group, immediate circle, who was exposed to the radiation, developed radiation sickness or effects, compared to people around them who were devastated by that, who were not eating the macrobiotic diet. So that led researchers in Japan and elsewhere to, to research what foods in the macrobiotic diet protect against radiation. And they discovered especially two. One was miso, which is the fermented Japanese, the soybean paste, aged for maybe two years in a good, good quality miso. And the other were vegetables from the ocean, various sea vegetables, edible sea algae, such as the one is called wakame especially. The other is called kombu. These bind with radio particles, the radioactive particles, and excrete them. The, from the body. Kind of a chelation. Chela uh, kind of like that, yeah. exactly. And I've had personal experience with my clients who benefited enormously from using these foods during radiotherapy uh, and had far fewer the side effects than the average the clients who were not doing the, those foods or doing a macrobiotic diet. Mm -hmm. Well, um, there is concern for our veterans who were possibly exposed to depleted uranium, which was part of uh, munitions yep. for Iraq. tank shells and also in the, the desert storm. And also Kosovo, I think, in yeah. the Balkans, right? And uh, the people in the Balkans were exposed. Yeah. Many of these isotopes that were potentially involved are very long-lived uh, and stay in the system for, for years. So uh, there'd be a, a therapy or a way to uh, separate the body from the radioactive material, that would be huge, yeah. they would say. One nowadays. way would be to incorporate these foods into the diet. And I have a personal theory that some type of lithium uh, supplement, when taken together with exercise, may bind with the, it's uranium-238, right? That's one is, of the isotopes, the bi yep. yeah. the leftover <coughs> one from the, from the Depleted, original. yeah may bind with that and then transform that and help that to pass out from the body. So mm -hmm. let's see. Let's do research on that. Yes. Well, Ed, as I implicated, I would like to possibly bring the benefits of macrobiotic therapy, again, selling it nothing more than a very healthy way of eating to our patients and the residents of Northeast uh, Pennsylvania. Can you share your thoughts with that? The macrobiotics would have tremendous the benefit for the community here. Both the cancer recovery community, enhancing the effects of their therapy, minimizing side effects from their therapy, and quite possibly uh, assisting in both their recovery and longevity and remission from their cancers, okay? Very quite possibly. And for the broader community, uh, enhancing everyone's well-being, 
minimizing the risk of diabetes, the risk of heart disease, the risk of cancer, uh, even possibly contributing to more recent epidemics, such as the opioid abuse epidemic. I believe macrobiotics has a role there in minimizing the impact of that and reducing the impact of that and helping those people to become free of that. Well, Ed, this is an epidemic that uh, Northeast Pennsylvania is struggling with. Our county in particular, uh, in 2015, we had 25 drug-related deaths, many of them opioids. And many of them young people, I guess, right? Yes, although there's a spectrum there, too. But um, this past year, 2016, we saw it skyrocket to 78 such Three deaths. Threefold increase. Yeah. And we are on track to do that again uh, this year. So, uh, again, anything that could uh, help our uh, patients, the citizens here, would be... I think, I think the macrobiotic diet could help, first of all, in reducing the so-called back pain. You, ha you had said that back pain was a that's, major that's factor. That's often the trigger, trigger. Uh, back pain or even athletic injuries. And um, again, the, as I said, the uh, physicians in Pennsylvania are being re-educated on uh, the proper use of uh, narcotic analgesics. But again, I think many people might have been uh, exposed to it. And again, uh, it's, it's an addiction. So macrobiotics could very much help that segment of that addictive group reduce the need, right? The second is, my theory is that once they're addicted, that cycle of addiction is very much the, um, related to their blood sugar levels especially low blood sugar, triggering the need for that kind of medication. So we've treated very successfully, not only us, but also studies in China, chronic alcoholism, which is also blood sugar related, using a substance known as kuzu, kuzu root starch. Are you, you're familiar with yes, that? Yes, in fact, that was part of one of the desserts we yeah. had last yeah. night. Yeah. And that kuzu, kuzu that. has been shown to stabilize blood sugar and help chronic alcoholic people get off of alcohol. And I have a feeling there's a role for that in the opioid addiction as well, together with the plant-based diet to ease pain for pain relief. And there are other simple remedies that we can deploy, non-pharmaceutical, for the relief of pain as well. Well, So let's, I hope we can begin that kind of yes. outreach and study. I'm happy to tell our viewers that we are about to start a pilot study here at the Simon Kramer Institute in conjunction with IMI, which is the International Macrobiotic Institute that Ed and the OMI are involved in. And um, Ed, can you tell us a little bit about the launch of this and what schedule we're hoping, we'll be on? We're hoping for the last week in March, last weekend in March, I should say, a four-day seminar here at the center. Um, the core group will be a group of uh, cancer patients who are receiving therapy here, and we'll give them full instruction, full guidance, how to incorporate the macrobiotic diet and lifestyle as part of their regimen of therapy and treatment. And then also those courses will be, while we're here, we'll also be, I should say, offering lectures and cooking classes for the broader public. Uh, so both the communities will be served by our educational outreach, and we're hoping to begin that and maintain that on a monthly basis uh, indefinitely. Yes. I think the impact on your community in this part of the state is going to be, and the country is going to be quite substantial. Well, also we're committed to, uh, again, strengthening these recommendations with evidence-based results. So we'll be asking people to uh, follow up and we can not only measure the length of life, but we'll also be do doing quality of life uh, studies. Yeah, if we could accumulate a database here, then this would yeah. be of enormous value for and, practitioners all over the world. And contact information for uh, the IMI and for the Simon Kramer Institute are now being uh, placed on the screen. So again, please contact us if you have uh, interest in such studies and in participation. And, just increasing general knowledge of the macrobiotic revolution. Thank you so much for uh, tuning in. And again, thank you so much for 
traveling down from Pittsfield, Massachusetts. And again, I, I also understand that wedding bells are in the offing very soon. So again, uh, congratulations. <laughs> Thank so you much. very Thank much. Thank you very much, Dr. Yeah. Moore.